I never intend to do the next thing that I do, but when an opportunity comes along that is just so juicy, and I feel that my skill set fits it, and I'm missing, I think, a little bit of the roar of the crowd and just the competitive arena, I say, I, I think I may hate myself tomorrow, but I, I've got to do this. At six feet, nine inches, Lee Walker has a form befitting a man destined to shape the world. A childhood dream of becoming a priest instilled in Walker an immense sense of justice, matched only by his creative ingenuity and passion for learning. As former president of Dell Computers, Walker turned a small, struggling startup business into one of the top names in the industry. His greatest lessons, however, stem from his lesser achievements, more commonly referred to as failures. One thing about the Catholicism I was taught was just the sense of justice. There was a you know, very definite right, a very definite wrong. And I think about you know uh, how has that affected my life. I, the, uh, the story that comes to mind was I was one year out of Harvard Business School, and I was working for Union Carbide. Had a mountain of school debt, um, and um, I was working for a great, great man called Alf Lamb. And he said, Lee, you just had you had a great first year here. I mean, you're going to go right to the top. He says, I never, I will never make it to the top. And I said, well, that's not possible. And he said, well, he said, you have to understand that Union Carbide is a very waspy place, and I'm Jewish, and it's just not going to happen. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. That is, that's astonishing. And he said, well, you know, it's, you know, it's called life. And I said, no, it's not. I, I said, I quit. And I said, if what you're saying is true, and I believe I, no, I, I'll quit tomorrow. And I did. And I said, why are you quitting? I said, well, I think this is just an unjust place. I think the biggest moment for me was probably that illness that took me from Dell because it was, there was sort of an old damn aspect. Like, you know, we were going to make some serious money and I'll get to participate in that. I got very sick. Uh, I had a form of meningitis. I was, I thought I was dying. In fact, I thought I died. I actually thought I died and went over and was told, uh-uh, and got pitched back. I think the defining thing then was being pitched back and beginning a process of introspection about what's, what is going on here. I think the essence of it was that I wanted the personal freedom. And I couldn't imagine my life, you know, in this sort of sludgy thing where, um, where my schedule was not, not under my control. And I'm willing to accept less money, less everything else if I have personal freedom. That to me, in, in my personal interpretation of entrepreneurship is the essence of, of, of why I do it. The money is very important. The uh, artistry of creating something is very important. The imagination, gratification is very important. But for me, the kernel, I think the core, the hot core, is, is to be free. Any serial entrepreneur that says they haven't had failures is not a serial entrepreneur because no matter how talented you think you might be and no matter how hard you work, Again, circumstance and chance, and just human frailty, you're going to fail. And, and I've, I've got several. Uh, and I don't enjoy talking about them, but it's like going to confession. I think it's probably good for the soul. My grandfather, his business failed. My great-grandfather, I think, died of heartbreak because his business failed. Uh, we have business cycles that are brutal. And so to me, I'm very aware that failure is always around the corner and I can't afford failure. So it's a tricky answer, isn't it? Because you, um, this failure thing is, for some of us, is so unacceptable that it's a powerful motivator. And I remember, had I just let my teeth chatter and rolled over, I, my business career would have ended a long time ago in a rather ignominious failure, and I, I would have gone under. It's a question of richness of imagination, 
the courage that comes from desperation and uh, attention to opportunity. But as you go through, hoping that at least your initial launch is, it gets you airborne, I think it's the setbacks or the failures that I've learned so much from. And so I, each of mine failures has, I've, I've taken two or three things away that's then allowed me to be that much stronger the next time around. I like to teach. There's no happier activity than teaching. Uh, and to catch them at this kind of, uh, what, vulnerable, nodal moment in their life where they're searching. You want to learn something, I guess, as the cliche goes, teach it because you'll learn even more. I'm wildly interested from a learning standpoint in the topics of justice, place, transit, entrepreneurship, healthcare, and education. Those six make my tuning fork just go brrrr, and I won't learn all I can about them. Um, and so I teach them. This is the reflection after many years, and I think I can see the truth clearer now, was that for me, entrepreneurship wasn't an end unto itself, but was means to a larger end. Because without the abundance that entrepreneurship creates, I couldn't have a life of teaching. I couldn't have a life of community service. It's fun. You've, you've, you've got uh, a highly competitive situation. You're free, in a sense, to create your own destiny. If it works, you get lots of money, which is immensely fun. Uh, you get lots of positive strokes on your successes. You tend not to talk about your failures, and those kind of fade into the woodwork. And it's just a, it's just a kick, you know? It's just a rush. And very, it's, it's uh, um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's been completely seduced by that. Uh, and, and, and with no apologies. And I think what I will give myself credit for is I think the universe delivered me a gift and, and, I, and I opened it, you know, I unwrapped it and embraced it.